Well, on this beautiful spring day, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Concordia University, Wisconsin. It's 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the time set for convening Wisconsin Energy's 2015 annual meeting of stockholders. I'm Gail Kloppa, Chairman and Chief Executive of Wisconsin Energy, and I will serve as Chairman for today's meeting. Well, we're delighted to be back at Concordia, our annual meeting home away from home, and I'd like to thank the President of Concordia, the Reverend Dr. Patrick Feria, and his entire staff for their always gracious hospitality. Now, before we begin our session today, I'd like to ask a young gentleman by the name of Brad Grosskreutz out of our gas operations in northwestern Wisconsin to please join me here at the podium. Brad, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. It was a sunny fall afternoon last November when Brad pulled up to a home in New Auburn, Wisconsin on a service call. He noticed that the kids were just getting out of school across the street, so he pulled into the driveway of the home out of courtesy to the buses and parents who were picking up their children. Well, Brad finished his work in about 45 minutes, filled out his report, and then he did something that turned out to be incredibly important. Brad got out of his truck and did a quick safety walk around before leaving. And near the back bumper, something caught Brad's eye. He saw the bottoms of two tennis shoes peeking out from underneath the truck. Well, those shoes, as it turns out, belonged to a six-year-old boy who was lying under the truck, hiding from his buddies during a game of hide-and-seek. So after getting the boy out from under his temporary hiding place, Brad firmly explained that hiding under a truck was very dangerous and that he should never crawl under a truck or any other vehicle. You know, bewildered and probably a little scared, the boy gave Brad one of those deer-in-the-headlights looks and dashed off down the street. Now, Brad later reported this incident as a near miss. That's a process we use to help all of us stay focused on safety and safe work practices. You know, we, we take safety very seriously at our company because our employees work in dangerous environments every single day. And working safely and going home to their families at night are more important than anything. But sometimes it's the little things that our employees do that make a huge difference. Like Brad, taking 20 seconds to walk around his truck to conduct a routine safety inspection. On that sunny fall day last November, that simple routine act very likely saved a young boy's life. And Brad, who knows, that young guy might grow up to be Wisconsin uh, Energy President one day. Brad, in recognition of your safe work practices and your actions last November, it's my great pleasure to present you with the Chairman's Award. Thank you, Thank you Brad. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Also in your honor, the We Energies Foundation will make a $5,000 contribution, as you see on the screen, to your favorite charity. It's called Unlimited Play. For those of you who may not be familiar, Unlimited Play is a nonprofit organization that builds playgrounds that are accessible to children and adults of all physical abilities. This donation will help fund Tri-Angels Playground in River Falls, Wisconsin. Brad, thank you again for your caring attitude and for the great work you do. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will please stand, Brad will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Take care. Brad, thank you again. All right, well, I'm delighted to see all of you here this morning. I'd also like to extend a word of welcome to those who are joining us via the Internet. As we have for the past several years, our meeting is streaming live this morning at wisconsinenergy.com. And now it's time to call our 2015 annual meeting to order. I've been given the inspector's report, which indicates that more than 85% of the company's outstanding shares are represented. This constitutes a quorum under the company's bylaws, and this meeting, therefore, is duly convened to conduct business. 
At the end of our formal program, we'll be happy to answer as many of your questions as time allows. As always, some of the information you will receive at our meeting today is forward-looking na in nature and is based on our current expectations. Our projections clearly involve risks and uncertainties, factors discussed in the company's latest Form 10-K and in future reports filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission could cause our actual results to differ materially from those described today. Now we'll begin our business session by introducing the members of the Wisconsin Energy Board of Directors. I would ask each director to please stand as I introduce them and remain standing until all directors have been recognized. Please, ladies and gentlemen, hold your applause until the end of the introductions. We'll begin with John F. Bergstrom, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Bergstrom Corporation. Barbara L. Bowles, retired Vice Chair of Profit Investment Management and retired Chairman of the Kenwood Group. Patricia W. Chadwick of Ravengate Partners, LLC. Kurt S. Culver, non-executive chairman of MGIC Investment Corporation and Mortgage Guarantee Insurance Corporation. Thomas J. Fisher, principal of Fisher Financial Consulting, LLC. Henry W. Knippel, retired chairman and chief executive officer of Regal Belight Corporation. Ulysses Payne, Jr., managing member of Addison Clifton, LLC. And Mary Ellen Stanick, managing director and director of asset management for the Baird Financial Group. We have a terrific board. Please join me in a round of applause for all of our directors. <laughs> now I'd like to recognize the officers of Wisconsin Energy and its subsidiaries, as well as the union and management representatives who are here with us today. Our union and management teams work very closely together to address important company issues. Folks, would you please stand? Thank you. I'd also like to introduce Susan Hogan from our transfer agent, Computer Share. Susan has been appointed as the inspector of election for our meeting. And Susan, would you please stand? Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and also with us today are representatives of Deloitte and Touche, Tricia Pemberton, Scott Roble, and Bill Graff. They're our auditors, and they'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about our 2014 financial statements. Tricia, Scott, and Bill, where are you? Very good, thank you. And now I'll call on our Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary, Susan Martin, to report on the proposals that we have before us this morning. Susan. Thank you, Gail. On March 26, 2015, a notice of this meeting was sent to all stockholders of record as of February 26, 2015. As set forth in your proxy statement, there are three items requiring a vote. First, election of nine directors to serve for terms expiring at the annual meeting of stockholders in 2016. Second, ratification of Deloitte and Touche LLP as independent auditors for 2015. And third, the advisory vote on compensation of the named executive officers, or say on pay. If you previously voted your proxy, your vote has already been recorded. At this time, I would like to ask if there are any outstanding proxies that have not been turned in to be counted. If you have not yet voted, please raise your hand and an usher will pick up your ballot. Thank you. The vote is now closed. I have been appointed to vote all of the shares represented by the proxy votes sent in by our stockholders. I have submitted the proxy ballot which reflects your instructions to the Inspector of Election. The preliminary inspector's report has been completed. The following nominees for election to the Board of Directors all received more than 91 percent of the votes cast and have been duly elected. John Bergstrom, Barbara Bowles, Patricia Chadwick, Kurt Culver, Thomas Fisher, Gail Kloppa, Henry Knippel, Ulysses Payne, Jr., and Mary Ellen Stanick. Each director will serve until the 2016 annual meeting. The proposal to ratify Deloitte and Touche LLP as independent auditors for 2015 has received an affirmative vote of more than 95% of the votes cast. 
Deloitte and Touche is therefore ratified as the independent auditors for 2015. The proposal to approve the compensation of the company's named executive officers as disclosed in the proxy statement has received the affirmative vote of more than 92 percent of the votes cast. This vote was advisory and not binding. However, the board does review the voting results and takes them into consideration when making future decisions regarding executive compensation. I will now turn the meeting back over to Gail, who will discuss our 2014 performance and our outlook for the future. Susan, thank you very much. We appreciate all your good work. Well, as I was preparing my remarks for our session today, I couldn't help but recall a quotation from a true American icon, actually one of the founders of our industry. It was the genius of Thomas Elva Edison that transformed the night and literally has transformed with electricity the way we live, the way we work, and the way we conduct ourselves. And Thomas Edison was fond of saying, as you can see on the screen, that good fortune often happens when opportunity meets preparation. And the reason I'm so fond of that statement is I think that Thomas Alva Edison's quote here really is indicative of the year 2014 for Wisconsin Energy. And I'd like to walk you through some of the highlights. We were able to achieve the highest net income in company history and the highest earnings per share in company history. For the year 2014, our earnings came in at $2.65 a share, up about 5.6% from the record that we had set in 2013. Operationally, we had a terrific year. And for the fourth year in a row, an outside engineering and consulting firm named our company the most reliable utility in the Midwest. The data that is used analyzes outages for customers and the amount of restoration time that it takes to get customers back in service once the outages occur. So that means, being the most reliable utility in the Midwest, that we had fewer outages and faster restoration time than any other company in our region. Again, very proud of our folks who have been able to turn in these kinds of results. It's a testament not only to the talent of our field folks, but also to the continuing investments that we've made in upgrading our system to maintain our industry-leading position in reliability. We also achieved, and as you know, we talked earlier with Brad about safety, we also achieved the safest year of operation in the long and storied history of this company. We actually have in the company safety records that date back to the 1900s. And 2014, in terms of OSHA incidents and lost time accidents, was the safest year in our long history. We've actually had a very good run in terms of, in terms of safety improvement and safety performance since 2003. As you can see on the screen, our OSHA incidents are actually down more than 80% since 2003, and very importantly, our lost time accidents are down by nearly 75% since 2003, and we continue with a laser-like focus on safe operations everywhere we serve. Also very pleased to tell you that our customer satisfaction emphasis continues to pay off. And during 2014, J.D. Power, which is one of the national survey firms that actually surveys uh, customer satisfaction across a broad range of industries. And J.D. Power during 2014 did its normal survey of customer satisfaction among residential customers nationwide. We Energies during 2014, according to J.D. Power, was number one in the Midwest for customer service, number one in the Midwest for power quality and reliability, and we were ranked top quartile nationally in overall satisfaction among our residential customers. For those of you who have followed our company for a number of years, the statistics on this slide won't surprise you, but I wanted to present them again because I think they are so important and so indicative of the environmental improvement that we've also been able to make across our footprint. As you know, we have embarked on a very significant power plant construction program. When we entered the year 2000, the state of Wisconsin was very short on power plant capacity. There was great concern about potential brownouts and blackouts, and we embarked with Wisconsin Public Service Commission approval on a major power plant construction program. The result of that program, which is now complete, is that we have expanded our capacity to produce electricity by 50% 
since the year 2000. So we have 50% more power plant capacity than we had in the year 2000. But at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, our emissions of nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and mercury have all reduced by more than 80%. The effectiveness of the investments we've made in environmental controls is clearly showing through in this data. So we are far more environmentally sound than we were just 14 years ago. Also pleased to report to you that during 2014, Wisconsin Energy was ranked as one of the 100 best corporate citizens in the United States by a national magazine called Corporate Responsibility Magazine. 2014 marked the seventh consecutive year that we've made the nation's best list. And when you look over the course of that seven-year period, what is remarkable is that very few companies have maintained a position on the nation's best list for seven consecutive years Pleased to say that Wisconsin Energy is one of those companies. And then as we close 2014, uh, we had another very positive surprise. Forbes Magazine, which I know all of you are familiar with, Forbes Magazine each year looks at companies across the United States and actually divides the economy of the United States into 27 separate sectors. And then Forbes chooses, based on its own criteria, the best managed company in their view in every one of those 27 sectors. There are names on this list that you will be very familiar with, household names. For example, in the aerospace industry, Boeing was named the best managed company in the United States by Forbes. In the apparel industry, if any of you have children or grandchildren, you're probably very familiar with Under Armour. Under Armour was named by Forbes as the very best managed company in the apparel industry. In telecommunications, Verizon was named America's best managed company. And I'm very pleased to report to you that for utilities, for the first time ever, Forbes magazine named Wisconsin Energy the best managed utility in the United States. One of the factors that has helped all along the way in terms of our financial performance, in terms of our stock price performance, is that we've been able to deliver industry-leading dividend growth over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. You can see the pace of our dividend growth on the chart behind me. And of course, as the calendar turned to January of 15, we were able to securely give you another dividend increase. Our board of directors authorized a dividend increase just above 8% in January of this year for first quarter dividend payments and for the remainder of this year. And we continue to target a payout ratio, meaning we continue to target paying out 65 to 70% of our earnings in dividends to you. And during 2014, through dividend payments to you and through our share buyback program, we actually returned more than $370 million of cash to our shareholders. That was the second best cash return year in our company's history. Now, 2014 was a very strong year in the, in the stock market for utilities as a whole, and we were no exception. Our share price actually set 29 new all-time highs during 2014, and as the year drew to a close on December 29, our stock hit $55.39 a share, an all-time high. And when that occurred, when the stock hit $55.39 a share, the enterprise value of the company, which we define as the market value of the stock and the face value of the debt, so the enterprise value of the company reached $17.7 billion for the first time in our history. In fact, Wisconsin Energy is the only company in any of the major utility indices, the S&P Electric Index, the Dow Utility Average, the Philadelphia Utility Index. You look at any of the major utility indices, and we are the only company that has been able to grow earnings per share and dividends per share every year since 2003. And certainly last year, the market rewarded that consistency of performance. So how about total shareholder return? Well, as I mentioned to you, uh, with low interest rates persisting in the United States and around the world for that matter, it was a very strong year for all of the utility indices. So if you had invested at the beginning of the year in the Dow utility average or any of the other utility indices that you see on the screen, 
your total shareholder return, which would be appreciation in the price and reinvested dividends, your total shareholder return would have been around 30%, which is incredibly strong for an investment in a utility index. Pleased to report that we outperformed the utility index with a total shareholder return last year of 32.1%. How about three years? We're going to go through history a little bit, folks, because this is fun. Uh, over the course of the last three years, again, a strong period of time for performance for utility stocks. And if you'd invested in any one of these utility indices, your returns would have been really strong, anywhere between 40 and 49% in terms of total shareholder return over the three-year period ending in 2014. But if you just invested in Wisconsin Energy, your total shareholder return would have come in at 67%. And while we're having fun, let's look at five years. Again, a very strong period for utility performance with total shareholder returns ranging from 76 to over 90% for an investment in any one of these major utility indices. By comparison, Wisconsin Energy's total shareholder return, nearly 150%. And finally, a look at the decade. Again, a pretty good decade for utility stocks and the utility averages, with about 171% total shareholder return for those who had invested in the Dow utility average. And then the broader indices, the Dow Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, not quite as strong in terms of total shareholder return as the utilities, but still up more than 100% in each case over the past 10 years. And again, by comparison, Wisconsin Energy's total shareholder return, 317.9%. So we've been very, very pleased with how the market has responded to the progress and financial performance of the company. Thank you. Now, just a couple of days ago, we released our first quarter earnings. You may have seen them covered in the newspaper. We came in at 90 cents a share. Our adjusted earnings were 90 cents a share for the first quarter of this year. And actually, even though that's down a penny, from the first quarter of last year, we were very pleased with 90 cents, and, and, and here's why. For all of you who are Wisconsinites or Upper Peninsula of Michigan residents, you remember how brutal the winter of 2014 was. It was the polar vortex winter, and a year ago in the first quarter of, of 2014, that polar vortex winter drove demand for natural gas for heating and drove demand for electricity to first quarter levels that we have never seen before. We were able to meet those demands, but the first quarter polar vortex weather drove our earnings to a first quarter record that we probably won't see for a long time to come at 91 cents a share. So to come close even to the polar vortex first quarter, I think is, is a, quite an accomplishment. One of the reasons that we were able to report 90 cents a share in this year's first quarter is that this year's first quarter, while actually colder than normal, not as severe as the polar vortex period, obviously, but about 12% colder than normal. And our customers really wanted to stay warm. In fact, during February, we delivered more natural gas to our retail customers this February than even February of a year ago, and not just by a little bit. We broke our February delivery record for natural gas this February by more than 5.5%. So we're off to a solid start. We're off to a strong start. Our projection for the year still remains in the range of $2.67 to $2.77 a share. And I wanted to share one other fact with you that I think you might find of interest. We are continuing to see solid customer growth. For example, in 2014, on the electric side of our business, we added 4,358 new customers. That was 5.7% more new customers than we added in 2013, and we were on time with hooking those customers into our system 100% of the time. We're seeing even stronger growth, ladies and gentlemen, on the natural gas distribution side of our business. More than 8,200 customers hooked into our natural gas distribution network during 2014. That was up over 28% from a double-digit growth the year before. Now, one of the reasons we're seeing this growth in new customers on our natural gas network is really the fact that Wisconsin historically 
particularly in the rural areas, have used propane for heating. Wisconsin, from the national statistics, is one of the five heaviest propane-using states in the United States. And given what happened a year ago with the shortage of propane and the high cost of propane, we have a tremendous value proposition if you convert to our natural gas network. So we believe we're going to continue to see strong growth in terms of new customers for natural gas. So ladies and gentlemen, where do we go from here? Well, we have a very well thought out, solid investment program for the next five years. We plan to invest between 3.3 and $3.5 billion in infrastructure that will achieve one of three goals. One, to help renew and modernize our grid, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. We'll be needing to meet new environmental standards, and we want to make strategic investments that will help reduce our operating costs for customers. One of the more interesting projects that we have underway is a long way from here, actually, uh, way up in the northern part of the state where northeastern Wisconsin meets the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We've gotten Public Service Commission approval, basically, to build a new powerhouse at a hydroelectric plant that's been in operation for many, many years, and the expected cost of this investment is 60 to $65 million. Now, for those of you who've been around us a while, you know that at our annual meetings, we tend to have our own version of Where's Waldo? And this year, Waldo, <laughs> Oh, we're bringing out the A stuff today, aren't we? Uh, our senior vice president for power well, generation, Tom Metcalf, is up at Twin Falls and will tell us a little bit about the work. Good morning, Waldo. <laughs> Gail, good morning, everybody. I have some sad news for you all. Uh, Tom was captured by Bigfoot last night, so you've got Waldo here today to do the presentation. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, I can't keep this up, but I will say that if uh, Waldo could speak, he'd have a British accent. <laughs> this, by the way, is Tom morning, Metcalf, our, our Senior Vice President for Power Generation. And Tom, tell us where you're standing. I'm in the rocks at Twin Falls. Right, I am at the Twin Falls site on the Menominee River. And uh, behind me, you can see uh, the existing Twin Falls power plant. And in a moment, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing up here. But Gail, just before I do that, I might just uh, give our shareholders a little background on our hydroelectric fleet. We sure. have 13 hydroelectric power plants uh, in the Upper Peninsula and in Wisconsin. And they generate about 86 megawatts of renewable energy for our customers. Which, uh, but it's not just the power plants uh, that we manage here, Gail. We also manage about 125 miles of river. It includes 36 uh, recreational areas. Uh, 95 uh, wilderness campsites and, and 27 boat launches. It's, it's really a commitment to the environment and to the community up here in this uh, pristine wilderness. Very good. Now, Tom, I think right behind you and just above you is the coffer dam that we've built to uh, help us move our way through Correct. this construction project. How about tell our shareholders a little bit about what they're seeing behind you? Well, right. Um, if you look just to my right here, you can see in the background there, that's the Coffer Dam. It's sometimes known as a, as a gravity dam. And it's the temporary dam that we've built to create the dry space that we need so that we can excavate for the powerhouse, which you can see in the foreground here. Now, one interesting thing I'll, I'll mention, Gail, is that when we looked at our older facility, we realized there was a significant amount of renovation that was needed. And when we looked at that and also some additional spillway capacity that we need to build here at this site, we determined that a new facility was the most prudent outcome for our, for our customers and our shareholders, which is why we're building uh, this new Twin Falls project. And it allows us to capture uh, not only the new technology, we'll be able to produce 50% more energy from, uh, from this new facility, but it also allows us to continue to operate the older plant while the new plant is being built. Terrific. Now, Tom, right now we're on time and on budget. How about tell our shareholders when you expect to complete this particular project? Well, that's right, Gail. We're on budget and on schedule. Uh, we expect the unit powerhouse to be completed uh, by the end of this year, including the turbines itself. But uh, we'll start commissioning uh, next year and have this unit running by the fall of uh, 2016. Terrific. 
Well, Tom, you're doing great work up there. We appreciate it. Now, the last time I was there, I think I saw Bigfoot. So if he, invite, <laughs> if he invites you to dinner, be careful, okay? He said, you'll have to find me first. Remember, I'm Waldo. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Tom Waldo Metcalf. There we go. All righty. Uh, so that's a sample of the work that we're doing on the power generation side of our business. On the electric distribution side of our business, very important projects underway as well. We call it Deliver the Future, and what we are doing is focusing on the oldest functioning components that we have on our electric distribution network. The technology we use in our industry is incredibly reliable, but just like a human body, as you age, stuff happens. And when you look at the failure rates of the equipment that we use for our electric distribution network, the failure rates of that equipment actually begin to rise exponentially after they reach age 50. So we're looking at replacing and upgrading our system, particularly with the components on our network that are 50 years old or older. So for example, our plan between now and 2019 is to rebuild over 2,500 miles of electric distribution lines that are today more than 50 years old. We'll also plan to replace over 27,000 power poles, some of which, by the way, are now almost 100 years old, replace 22,000 transformers and literally hundreds and hundreds of substation components. And this effort, again, is to maintain our industry-leading reliability and to keep the energy flowing to our customers precisely when they need it. The same type of project is underway on the natural gas distribution side of our business, where between now and 2019, we will upgrade our natural gas network by replacing over 1,100 miles of vintage plastic and steel gas mains. We'll replace about 83,000 individual gas distribution lines. Those are the lines that come off the street and go straight to your home. And we'll replace nearly a quarter of a million meter sets with brand new metering technology. So a lot of work to do and a lot of productive investment to be made on our system over the course of the next five years. When I started out, I mentioned that 2014 was really a remarkable year, and in fact, we believe it will be a transformational year for our company. Transformational from the standpoint of a major acquisition that we announced on June 23 of 2014. You've probably all read about it. You may have some questions about it, which we'll be happy to answer. And I'd like to cover both the strategic rationale and the nuts and bolts of what we're doing with this acquisition. So we're planning to acquire a company called Integris. Integris is the parent firm of a number of utility systems, both electric and natural gas, in the Midwestern part of the United States. The transaction would be valued at just over $9 billion. It would be the largest non-banking acquisition ever made by a Wisconsin company. We believe that the combination of our company with Integris will create the leading electric and natural gas utility in the Midwest. We're also convinced that this combination will offer very significant benefits both to our shareholders and to customers across the Midwest. Now, over the years, as we've looked at potential acquisition opportunities, we have religiously applied three criteria. Because folks, the, the objective is not just to get bigger, the objective is to get better. And we believe that the only way you achieve both those, bigger and better, is if you adhere strictly to these three criteria. And the criteria are pretty simple, but they're very important. First, that after significant due diligence, we would have to firmly believe that the acquisition would add to earnings per share in the first full year after closing. In this case, that would be 2016. Secondly, that the acquisition would be largely credit neutral, and by that we mean we would not want to lose our single A category credit rating. We've worked very hard to have one of the strongest credit ratings in our industry, and we would not want that credit rating significantly diminished. And thirdly, again after due diligence, we would have to be convinced, as we are in this case, that the long-term growth prospects of whatever company we would acquire would have to be at least equal to our standalone growth rate. And I'm pleased to tell you that in all three of these criteria, 
this acquisition meets or exceeds the standards we've set. There's also very significant operational and financial fit. Uh, we really have, as you'll see in a minute or two, very, very strong overlapping service areas in many cases. And there's one other benefit. This is the only combination of companies that will allow one entity to own 60% of American Transmission Company, which is one of the largest independent transmission companies, electric transmission companies in the United States. So financially, we believe we can grow earnings per share with the combination together at 5 to 7% a year. That's faster than either company was projecting its growth going forward. And very importantly, 99% or more of those earnings would come from regulated operations. We've made a commitment, as we always do, to be good citizens wherever we serve, and our charitable contributions and our community involvement will remain in every market that we have a presence. We believe, after a lot of financial analysis, that our balance sheet will remain very strong and that we will continue to generate positive free cash flow year after year. So, how does all this begin to look? Well, we will keep our corporate headquarters in metropolitan Milwaukee. We will have operating headquarters in our three largest markets, Green Bay, Chicago, and Milwaukee. The senior leadership of the combined company will largely come from the senior leadership of Wisconsin Energy today. We will be having some Integris executives in some portions of the enterprise leading certain functions, but the most senior people uh, leading the enterprise, the combined enterprise, will come from Wisconsin Energy. We will expand our board of directors. Uh, our board of directors will be three persons larger. Uh, we, will, we will invite onto our board of directors three individuals, very qualified, talented individuals who are serving on the Integris board today. And we'll have to change our name a little bit because we won't be so solely focused on Wisconsin. So instead of Wisconsin Energy, our new name will be the WEC Energy Group. And the reason we wanted to keep WEC, other than just nostalgia, is that if we call ourselves the WEC Energy Group, we can maintain our stock ticker symbol at WEC. So we're looking forward to the day when we will morph into the WEC Energy Group. And I would like to give you just a sense now of the timeline that we think we can accomplish that. First of all, in our industry, uh, closing an acquisition can take anywhere from 12 to 30 months. It's a very long road in terms of all the specific approvals that one needs to obtain. We are working our way through the approval process for at least seven major approvals. First at the federal level, we needed approval from the U.S. Department of Justice, we needed approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we needed some approvals on telecommunication licenses from the Federal Communications Commission. All the approvals that we need from the federal agencies are now in, they're in hand, and complete. Then we need approval from four separate states here in the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota. In April, the Michigan Commission on April 23rd voted to approve the acquisition, and just a few days ago on April 30th, the Wisconsin Public Service Commission at its open meeting voted to approve the acquisition as well. So we're now down to two states, we're hoping to receive uh, Minnesota Commission approval in May, and I'm really hoping we get the Minnesota approval before the football season starts and the Packers beat the Vikings again. But I'm hopeful we can get that done before the football season. So we are hoping for Minnesota Commission approval in May, and in July, by regulation, the Illinois Commerce Commission must make its decision on the acquisition by no later than July 6. So we're getting very close now with just two state approvals left to come in. Now how about our dividend policy, which I know is so important to you? Well, for the Integra shareholders, there will be no change immediately. So their, their dividend payment won't go up, won't go down. The plan is to keep them whole and to keep them neutral. But for Wisconsin Energy shareholders, you can expect to receive, when we close the acquisition, an additional dividend increase of 7 to 8 percent, and of course that's above the 8 percent increase that our board declared in January. So you can look forward to another dividend increase 
at the time of the closing of the acquisition. And then going forward, we would expect to be able to grow our dividends at the same rate of earnings growth or in the range of 5 to 7% a year. So what does all this look like? Well, we'll kind of walk you through the Midwest. Today, We Energies, which is our major utility subsidiary, serves, as you can see in the yellow on the map, 1.1 million electric customers. Those are principally in the eastern side of the state of Wisconsin, and about 1.1 million natural gas customers spread over very many parts of the state of Wisconsin. So that's We Energies today. We will be adding Wisconsin Public Service, a well-run utility system based in Green Bay. As you can see on the screen, Wisconsin Public Service has about 450,000 electric customers and just over 325,000 natural gas customers. And, and, and look on the screen of the geographic fit. Together, we're almost hand in glove. And that's one of the things that, that is very beneficial here because, because we have such complementary operations that are very close to one another geographically. Then if you look down, the little dot on the map is North Shore Gas on the northern Chicago suburbs in Illinois. Uh, North Shore Gas has about 159,000 natural gas customers in Chicago suburbs like Waukegan and Winnetka and Glencoe. So North Shore Gas would be added to our system as well. And then the next dot on the map is very misleading. It's tiny, and you can see it right beneath the North Shore dot, but the reason it's misleading is within that dot on the map are 828,000 natural gas customers all inside the city limits of Chicago. So we will be adding the People's Gas Company, which is the natural gas distribution company for the city of Chicago, to our system. Then as we move east, Michigan Gas. Now, Michigan Gas, as you can see, is, is largely located in the southern tier of the state of Michigan. They have more customers on the western, southern, southern and western part of the state. 171,000 natural gas customers, smaller communities like Benton Harbor and Grand Haven. Uh, Michigan Gas is the fourth largest natural gas distribution company in the state of Michigan. And then we move west to Minnesota, and very much like We Energies, uh, Minnesota Energy Resources has natural gas customers uh, literally in pockets all over the state of Minnesota. 219,000 natural gas customers. Uh, one of their principal uh, cities in their service area is Rochester, where the Mayo Clinic is undergoing a major expansion right now. But they serve customers not only in Rochester, but in cities as far away as Duluth and International Falls. Now, International Falls is way up there and literally one of the coldest spots on the earth. So they really do need natural gas service in Minnesota. So we put it all together and here's what it looks like. 4.4 million customers, more than 70,000 miles of electric distribution lines, over 44,000 miles of natural gas lines, and over 8,800 megawatts of clean, efficient, modern, reliable power plant capacity. So again, we believe this will, this will make Wisconsin Energy and the WEC Energy Group the leading electric and natural gas utility system in the Midwestern part of the United States. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, I thought it was not only appropriate to look forward, but also perhaps for a second to look back. I mean, this company is a remarkable company. It has, it has been in existence for almost 115 years. The founding fathers of this company built our headquarters building back in 1896. The company has prospered, the company has thrived, the company has succeeded through good times and bad, through war and peace, through recession and prosperity. And I think it's important as we take this new venture forward to look back and remind ourselves of why this company has done so well in so many circumstances. And I think it comes down to four very important elements, what I call the fabric of an enduring enterprise. First, focus intently on the fundamentals. Excel at the fundamentals of our business, reliability and customer satisfaction. 
which leads to the second element, keeping the customer at the heart of everything we do. We try, every one of us in our company, to get up every day and work to help grow and support the communities we serve. And lastly, I think our success has also been driven by valuing and developing our employees who truly are making a great difference in a mission that matters. So ladies and gentlemen, with, with the talent that we're fortunate to have in our company, with the financial discipline that we have demonstrated, with the passion that we have for continued improvement. I stand before you today and I can honestly say that I'm confident that the best, the best ladies and gentlemen, is yet to come. Thank you very much. All right, well, it's time now for the question and answer portion of our meeting. If you have a question or a comment, please feel free to step to a microphone nearest to you, and an attendant will be happy to assist you. Now, before asking your question, we would ask you to please state your name and your city of residence for the minutes. I'd also ask that you please limit yourself to one question or comment so that others may have the opportunity to speak during the time that we have together. So thank you very much. Who has the first question? Yes, microphone number three, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klapa. Uh, my name is Christine Mer Nuremberg. I live in the city of Mequon, and I'm here representing the Mequon Nature Preserve um, Board of Directors, of which I'm a member. You're welcome, Christine. <laughs> nice to see you. Wonderful presentation. Thank Gives you. us great confidence in a wonderful company. Well, thank you. But my comment, are, I really want to thank you personally and Wisconsin Energy for your commitment to a healthy environment. Uh, when the Mequon Nature Preserve uh, started, in 2002, your company was there from the very beginning to support our work, which was to create a um, nature conservancy and to renovate our education center to environmental um, sustainable standards. And thousands of people have benefited, including many thousands of children. So um, for these reasons, um, last June, our, our agency gave you personally and We Energies our first stewardship award for all the work that you do to support the environment and for your effort to make this community, including the metropolitan area, a better place for all of us to, to live and work. Um, so on behalf of the Board of Directors, we want to thank you again for accepting our award and doing the things you do on behalf of this community and for the environment, and congratulations to you and a great company. Well, thank you so much, Christine. That's very nice of you, and I was really honored to receive the award. You do some great work there. That's a terrific place. And, and we, we appreciate what you're doing very much. Thank you. I, I, uh, microphone number four, please. Hi, I'm Stephen Shellen. I live in Sussex. Uh, I'm a former employee of Wisconsin Electric. And uh, we've had three generations of my family work for the company. So oh, I'd terrific. like to say that the company is not just the board of directors and the, the staff that you showed here, but thousands of employees out there that work very hard to achieve what you've shown. Absolutely. Uh, to follow up on the charitable giving, I'll bring up again, as I have in the past, uh, I think you should reinstate matching of charitable giving for retirees, which since your term here was limited to just the first year after retirement. I'd like to see that reinstated, and I think with the excellent growth that we've shown that that is something that is very possible for the WEC Foundation, of which I was a member. Um, I have a couple questions relative to the proxy statement. Um, sure. On page P17, you t it talks about the direct engagement by management of 15 of our largest stockholders during 2014. They comprise approximately 35% of the out shares outstanding, and the things that were discussed were forwarded to the board. Is there any record of this that the other 65% of the shareholders can access to see what information was given to those 15 shareholders and what information we can use to determine our future management and handling of our shares. Right. Very good question. Uh, let me explain the shareholder engagement because it's something that 
companies are reporting now, it's fairly new in terms of the, the proxy statement information. Uh, and, and let me back up by saying about 75% of our stock is held by major institutions uh, all over the world, literally. I mean, we have one of our largest shareholders in Frankfurt, Germany. We have a huge shareholder in Norway. Uh, we have a, uh, our biggest active shareholder actually in Montreal. And increasingly, what these shareholders want is basically a sit down or a lengthy phone conference with the senior management of the company. We have not provided those shareholders any information that you are not privy to, but basically what they want to do is have an in-person update uh, on the developments with the company, on exactly the type of information that I shared with you today. So these are really sessions that are designed to give individual attention to our very largest shareholders, but by law, we cannot provide them any information that's not publicly available, and we don't do so. Uh, so all of the information that we've shared with those, with those holders you have access to just as they do. I mean, these are simply courtesy meetings to make sure that they understand our direction and that we answer any, any questions that we can that we've already answered publicly. The, you know, the periodic uh, statements that you make to the investment industry are recorded and available for us. That, that is uh, correct. In fact, we had our analyst call on Tuesday after we reported our earnings. If you go to our website, I think it's up on the website, guys. Yeah, the, the replay of the analyst call, you can click on the website and hear the entire thing. Is there some sort of summary that can go in the annual report of the other types of meetings? I mean, this is pretty brief and doesn't tell us very much. Well, and again, I, it's simply a, it, it, uh, let me tell you what will be very helpful to you on that front. Each month, we put together an investor book and that's what we take on the road when we go see our large shareholders. That investor book is filed publicly and you can obtain that, West, that, that investment book simply by going to our website. Okay, two other quick questions. Um, on P39, it's noted that uh, your salary increase was 3% outside the target range. I'd like an explanation of that. And then on P51, uh, it notes that there are make whole payments for the executive deferred compensation plan that provides a match the same level as the 401k plan. Right. I would like to uh, know if that is a, a make whole for taxes received or no. just to allow for the uh, sharing. No, it, it, to, to directly answer your question, there is not a tax make up on that. There's no tax make whole. This is simply the normal standard benefit that officers in companies across the United States receive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, we appreciate your time. Let's see. Yes, number one, please. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here, and I also wanted to say, first off, thank you for your commitment to the city of Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin as a lifelong resident, a UWM alumni, uh, yeah, uh, and an Eastside resident for the last five years. I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, my question is, uh, I've read a lot about uh, that there's been a lot of work going on in the city of Chicago to replace old gas lines. Right. And I'm wondering how the new company plans to uh, do that. Very good question. Thank you for coming today. What this gentleman is referring to is something called AMRP, the Advanced Main Replacement Program. In Chicago, believe it or not, uh, there are an entire network of aging, seriously aging, underground natural gas distribution pipes. Some of, those, some of those underground natural gas distribution lines in Chicago are literally Civil War era lines. And it's been widely recognized in Illinois, in fact, even by the Illinois legislature, that there needs to be an accelerated effort to replace those gas lines underneath the streets of the city of Chicago. So People's Gas has undertaken uh, what will be probably much longer than a 10-year program, uh, but replacing somewhere between 100 and 150 miles of underground natural gas distribution pipes each year in Chicago. Uh, and we will, be, we will be basically managing that program. Now, 
let me assure you that this is something we know how to do. In fact, we have already, in our service area here in Wisconsin, we've already completed the kinds of replacements over the course of the last decade that are just beginning now in Chicago. And we've been able to manage that program on time and on budget. Unfortunately, it requires digging up a lot of streets. So our theme song will be Dig We Must. Um, but we, we will be digging up streets in Chicago and hopefully restoring them very quickly and basically replacing the older and in many cases leaking underground gas pipelines with new natural gas distribution lines. That's essentially the program. My guess is that program will run the legislation enabling the program in Illinois is for 10 years. My guess is the work won't be able to be completed quite that quickly. So we may have a, we may have a very long runway ahead of us in terms of modernizing and upgrading the natural gas distribution network in Chicago. Hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Microphone number three, please. Good morning. My name is uh, Roy Shawey, and I live in the Mequon area. Uh, welcome, Roy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Very enjoyable. You pointed out at one time the uh, how you had control of a lot of the emissions and what progress was made, uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, emissions and so forth. My question is, uh, what uh, what will you be doing, or what can you say is the impact of the uh, EPA's new rules that they would like to put through yes. on CO2 emissions? That seems like that could be a, a extremely uh, heavy uh, financial burden. So I'll. Right. Wait for your right. answer. Very good question, Roy. And, and, and what Roy is referring to is something called the Clean Power Plan. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, at President Obama's direction, is putting together something called CPP, the Clean Power Plan, which would basically set targets for every individual state in the U.S. for reducing CO2 emissions between now and the year 2030 by a very significant amount. Uh, the, tar the, the, the preliminary targets that have been set, uh, by the, but actually been proposed by the EPA, they're not, this rule's not yet final. The preliminary targets would have Wisconsin needing to reduce its CO2 emissions by about 27% compared to where we were in 2012. A lot of us are concerned about the direction of this clean power plan. Uh, not that we oppose reducing CO2 emissions, but the aggressiveness of the plan, in fact, under the proposed plan, 87% of where we need to go, we'd have to get to by 2020. And frankly, that's just not doable. Uh, I was fortunate enough about six weeks ago to have a meeting with uh, a number of other, my counterparts in the industry, with the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and we tried to explain to her, and she was very gracious about listening to us, that there are going to be serious economic disruptions in this country if we have to get 87% of the way toward the final emission reduction goal five years from now when the rule isn't even final. So we are all asking that between now and June, when the final rule is supposed to be published, that the EPA step back and take a look at the interim rule and try to give us the flexibility we need to continue to make progress. Now, having said all that, I mentioned earlier we embarked on this very ambitious power plant construction program starting in the year 2000. The, new two, the two new coal-fired power plants that we've built on the shores of Lake Michigan and Oak Creek are literally among the cleanest burning coal-fired power plants in the world. They are also one of the seven most efficient power plants for baseload power plants in the United States. So we think we're very well positioned because the last thing you would do in terms of trying to, in trying to retire a plant is go after the newest, most efficient plants. So we have very efficient units both at Oak Creek and our new natural gas units at Port Washington that we think will actually help the state going forward in terms of trying to achieve its goals. So we, we think we're well positioned as a company. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that when the final rules come out, 
we'll all get some breathing room to try to actually make efficient progress and not progress that's going to kill everyone on their electric bills. I hope that responds to your question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Appreciate it very much. All right, back at number two. Uh, my name is Gino Dentis. Uh, I live in Hartford, Wisconsin. Welcome. Um, uh, I've been a stockholder for over 40 years in this company, and uh, my wife was uh, an employee of uh, We Energy. My question or comment this morning is that uh, recently uh, the Milwaukee Chamber of Commerce came uh, proposing that the state of Wisconsin cut off funding for the uh, Citizen Utility Board. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what your comment or your feeling on this issue. Thank you. All right, very good question. Thank you. And if you didn't hear the question, it's currently as the new state budget, the new Wisconsin state budget is being debated, there's a proposal to reduce the funding that all of our customers are paying through their electric bills, reduce the funding for an intervener group called CUB or the Citizens Utility Board. Uh, we were not involved really in any way in that proposal. Uh, we, we, we learned about the proposal basically as it was on the floor being debated by the, by the Joint Finance Committee. Uh, CUB has traditionally intervened in utility rate cases, not just ours, but in all kinds of cases before the Public Service Commission. Uh, they've been around for about 35 years. Uh, they do provide a valuable service, but up until 2009, they funded themselves. So all of their activity at the Public Service Commission, all of their viewpoints uh, were heard and paid for by their own fundraising. In 2009, uh, then Governor Doyle decided to provide a subsidy for CUB. So that subsidy has essentially been granted to CUB for the past five years. And what, and what the uh, Joint Finance Committee apparently is trying to do is simply reduce that subsidy, which would require CUB to have more skin in the game and would require CUB to basically raise its own funds, just like any other group has to do if they want to appear before the Public Service Commission. So that, I hope that answers your question, sir. All right. Yes, microphone number one. Good morning, and thank you so much for meeting with us today. Good morning. Uh, I'm just wondering, I've, I understand that you've been converting the Valley plant from coal to gas, and okay. I'm just hoping you can give us an update on how that's going. Ah, terrific. Question about our Valley power plant. For those of you who are not familiar, our Valley power plant is the last operating power plant inside the city limits of Milwaukee. Uh, it has been burning coal for 46 years. Uh, last year, we embarked on converting the Valley Power Plant away from coal to natural gas. Uh, there are two units at the Valley Power Plant. We successfully converted the first unit before this winter's heating season. We are now beginning the conversion work for the second unit. So as of, I think, Alan, was it April? We no longer are burning coal at the Valley Power Plant, and we would expect to have both units converted and providing very valuable service for downtown Milwaukee for many years to come, burning natural gas. There are two benefits, actually three benefits, to what we're doing at the Valley Power Plant. First of all, related to the gentleman's question earlier about emissions, we will materially reduce emissions from the Valley Power Plant because burning gas will reduce the emissions by about 50 percent. Secondly, uh, there will no longer be a very large and somewhat unsightly coal pile near downtown Milwaukee. Uh, and actually, we think some of that land can be used for economic development that the coal pile previously occupied. And thirdly, it will actually reduce our operating costs for the plant itself. So we're, we're really pleased that we got approval to go forward with that. Valley, by the way, not only provides electricity and, and voltage support for the grid, but Valley also provides steam heat for more than 400 customers in downtown Milwaukee. And that doesn't sound like a lot of customers, but one customer, for example, would be all of the buildings on the Marquette University campus. One building would be the U.S. Bank Tower. Uh, and I promised Mary Ellen, who works at the U.S. Bank Tower, we'd keep her warm with that steam this coming winter. Uh, so there'd be a lot of benefits to it. Thank you so much for your question. Yes, number two. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Mr. Klappa. Uh, my name is Doug Gohl. I'm a resident of Germantown, but I'm here as an employee of the BMO Harris Bradley Center. Oh, hi. How are you uh, doing? I'm good. How are you guys? We're good. <laughs> um, 
The reason why I came here today is to thank you. We, we had identified ex our exterior lighting at the center as, as an issue that we needed to improve upon in terms of for security and just to be more inviting for our guests. So our operations team reached out to Mr. Klapa's management team and they really worked hand in hand with us and provided some great options in terms of making our building that much better as people walk in so they feel better and they feel safer. And with this year, with the Bucks doing so well and a number of large concerts that we had, we had a lot more patrons coming in, and I think you guys really helped in terms of their experience, so thank you. Well, you're more than welcome. Thank you for saying that. I want to give Kevin Fletcher, who heads up our electric distribution network, the, 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 uh, the credit for that. We have a number, obviously, of really, really strong lighting specialists, and Kevin and one of our specialists went over, and, uh, and I think we helped the situation a little bit, and you're right. The additional lighting is really important to security around the Bradley Center, and go Bucks. Uh, microphone number one, please. Terry Fritz from Manitowoc. Hi, Terry. Um, right now, Duke Energy is going through a lot of ramifications where their cold slurry, oh, yeah. um, where it's getting in the river. Do yeah. we have technical barriers and legal barriers in place for anything like that? Very good question. If you didn't really follow the question, uh, Duke Energy had an environmental issue, a fairly serious environmental issue over the course of the last year with basically coal ash, the residue of, of burning coal at some of their power plants, uh, leaking out of the storage ponds that have housed the coal ash. Um, we're very fortunate in that from a technology standpoint, we never went in that direction. We do not have any, no wet storage coal ash ponds anywhere on our system. In fact, uh, Bruce Ramey, who's our VP of Environmental, uh, Bruce is one of, and, and he'll be embarrassed when I say this, but he is one of the world's experts on beneficial use of, that, of coal ash products. Uh, we are now selling for productive use, I think about 100% of the coal ash we produce every year, Bruce, am I right? Yeah. Sometimes more than 100%, he says, which is a pretty good trick. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, the coal ash is very strong. It has inert capabilities. So it's being sold for use in road building, for use in concrete, for use in foundations. So we basically have an entirely different environmental approach, which I'm very pleased that we have, because the, the liability associated with these wet coal, pond, coal storage ponds is very significant if they are not maintained well. Thank you for your question. All right, number two, please. Hello, Mr. Klappa, We Energy's board and employees and uh, shareholders. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm Kristen Geese, Executive Director of Mequa Nature Preserve, technically living in Hartford, so thank you. All right. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for the foresight and everything you've done. I echo Christine's comments. The foundation that you landed for Mequa Nature Preserve to grow is incredible, and your continued support has just made my day-to-day -day operations so much <laughs> go so much more smooth, so thank you. From the thousands of students who are reaching to the restoration efforts, um, I also want to thank you for the vision in creating and helping to assist the Fund for Lake Michigan. Without them, um, our extensive restoration efforts wouldn't go as smoothly. So with that, we're able to restore that many more acres. So thank you so much for your foresight and vision. And I'm excited for what you just said about uh, Mr. Remy, because I'm thrilled to get to know you a little bit better in the near future here. So thank sure. you. Well, thank you so much for your comments and for the great work that you do. We really appreciate it. Yes, uh, I have microphone number two, please. It's a popular microphone today. It is. Good morning, Mr. Clappa. Good morning. My name is Paula Nelson, and I'm here as president of Stars and Stripes Honor Flight. Oh, hi, Paula. How are hi. you? Nice to see you, Gail. Uh, I want to thank you and everybody here who has supported the Stars and Stripes mission from the beginning to get our World War II veterans to Washington, D.C. to see their memorials. You guys were instrumental in our Operation Resolve when the wait list consisted of World War II veterans who had not had a chance to see their memorial. Now we have an opportunity to honor not only the World War II veterans who still apply, but our Korean War veterans. And the wait list at the beginning of the year was very long. We had over 900 veterans waiting for a flight at the beginning of this year. Wow. And I wanted to thank you again for your generosity. Because of that, our board of directors and our volunteers are dedicated to getting all of those veterans to Washington, D.C. 
Many have waited more than two years, but with the help of, of your generosity, we have secured two flights, very large flights, if you know what I mean, for this fall, and we are pleased to um, announce Operation Parallel to honor our Korean veterans, so we have a mission to honor all of those veterans. So thank you again very much for your continued support. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome. I appreciate your comment, but I will tell you, in my mind, the single most compelling investment our foundation has ever made <clears throat> has been through the outer flights. Uh, these folks, all of them volunteers, have just done an incredible job and continue to do so, and we're, we're just pleased to be able to be a small part of helping to make that happen. Thank you so much. All right, uh, microphone number one, number three here. I can't read anymore. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nancy Horvat, and I come from Muskego. And I have a question. Well, first I want to say congratulations and thank you for sharing all the excellent information. Congratulations on all the wonderful work that's been going on. I have a question about the uh, merger and the preparations for the merger. Um, the number one cause of failed mergers is culture clash. And you had on a slide that employees are a very important part of the organization. I completely agree with that. So my question is around what are your plans for spending adequate time on the cultural issues and what is the way that you're going to address that? In other words, how are you going to be giving culture the same importance as the operational requirements for the merger? Okay, very good question, Nancy. Well, let me first say that, that one of the benefits we have going into the consolidation, going into the merger, is that both companies, as I've gotten to know all of the companies in their system a little bit better, both companies have very compatible operating philosophies. Uh, I have long known, as has our team, that for example, Wisconsin Public Service, incredibly well-run organization in the field. Uh, they have the same kind of focus on reliability and customer satisfaction that we do. Uh, and as we look across their system of companies, again, their cultural approach is very, very similar to ours. In fact, that's one of the things that my counterpart and I had lengthy discussions about before we agreed to do this. So the, 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 the job of basically forming a healthy and continuing to form a healthy culture with the combined companies will be far easier given the history and the, and the similarities in our focus. Uh, we do have uh, a very, very good day one team in place, representatives of both our company and their company working on, last I looked, it was 72 different items that we really want to make sure are in place and functioning well on day one so that we don't miss a beat. So we're, we're on it and we're going to stay focused on it. Thank you very much. All right. Terrific. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your questions. This concludes our 2015 annual meeting. We appreciate you being here and taking part. On a personal note, this is the 12th time that I've had the privilege of chairing our annual meeting, and I want to personally thank all of you for your encouragement and your support. Please be assured that our management team will work hard in the year ahead to uphold your confidence. Thank you again. Drive safely. Take care.